Hi, I'm Steve Rosted. I'm an open source engineer at VMware. I'm also a Linux kernel developer, and I'm the maintainer of the tracing subsystem within Linux, um, namely Ftrace. I'm also the maintainer of the stable real-time tree. And today I'm going to be talking about finding sources of latencies on your Linux system. So let's get started. Uh, once again, just want to say that this is, um, I'm a VMware employee and um, if you want to check out more about our, you know, uh, check us out on Twitter at VMW at Open Source, as well as the blogs at VMware.com and Open Source. So first thing I ask is, what is latency? So, you know, if I'm going to talk about finding the source of latency, let's give it a definition. And if you look it up on Wikipedia, it will tell you latency is the time interval between the stimulation of a end response or from a more general point of view, a time delay between the cause and the effect of some physical change in the system being observed. Okay, a lot of people are probably still scratching their head wondering exactly what is the definition of latency. So in simple terms, I will call it simply the time from when an event is supposed to happen to the time it actually does happen. Simple case, every morning when you wake up, say alarm clock goes off and it's very annoying, but that's when you're supposed to wake up. Then by the time you hit the alarm clock, that is the time you actually do wake up. And I would like to call this wake up latency. So where does latency come from? Now, if you look at your system, you'll see you have your application on the top layer. Uh, below that, your application will you're most likely be talking to a library. Uh, then that library will communicate to the kernel, and the kernel is what it will communicate to the actual hard drive uh, or not hard drive, but your hardware, your processor, um, uh, getting resources. And there's ways that the library can circumvent the um, kernel and even the application can circumvent, circumvent both the library to get to the kernel and or the hardware. But we're not gonna really talk about those details today. And also what I'm gonna say is uh, right now we're gonna do is focus on the latency that happens in the kernel and the hardware. You'll see that little black box there, the bias, the basic input output. Uh, which is from is basically firmware on your computer, and I kind of consider that part of the hardware. So let's look at the hardware latency. Where does that come from? Now, a lot of times what you'll have is something called a system management interrupt. Now, this is where the firmware is part of the hardware. So let's say you have a laptop, and your laptop requires thermal control. It's, it's a very small, um, everything's very, very small, and within the components of your laptop and you need to make sure it's cool but you don't want the fan running all the time so there's a lot of logic complex logic to make sure everything's doing everything correctly well you can't rely on the operating system to get this right because each laptop is uh, unique so that's where the bias the firmware has a way of managing how to keep your laptop cool no matter what the operating system is on top of it and it will usually trigger something called a system management interrupt and it will turn the system to a system management mode, which is basically hidden from the operating system. The operating system has no control over this. And this is where maybe it'll check to say, okay, we're starting to heat up, we gotta turn the fans on, or everything's cool, we could slow down the fans, or maybe we'll change the frequency of the CPU. Well, that work is a latency within your system. And if you're really interested about like real-time performance, you have to be aware of these type of changes. Other things that hardware can do is every time you have a cache miss or instruction or data cache miss, uh, that could cause a latency or branch prediction. Uh, basically, it's non-deterministic behavior is what's going to cause you. Uh, branch prediction, by the way, is when uh, you have your if statements within your code and to make sure it tries to, the CPU tries to stay up very, very fast, it will look way ahead. And when it sees a branch, it'll has to take a, make a choice about which way that will go. And based off of previous times that branch was taken, it will say, okay, most of the times it goes, it's a true case, so I'm gonna follow the true case. And that way it could keep, when the CPU gets up to that point, all the memory will be in cache and ready and uh, makes things much faster. But if the branch prediction is incorrect or flushed, it will have to stop at that point and then re-pull in the memory to continue. Um, Hyper-threading, when you have your multiple threads on one core. So if you have a, hyper-threading is when you have a CPU core that actually simulates two C logical CPUs. And when you have one logical CPU doing some sort of calc or task, and another logical CPU doing other tasks, it's really going, to, it's still, what it's doing is kind of shifting the work 
when one's fetching memory, the other one's going to be doing some processing of the CPU and back and forth. But it's really everything's, it's got to be shared resources. So depending on what's on the other thread, it could affect your latency. So, and finally, you have page faults and look aside buffers that uh, what happens is when you execute something, unless you did a M lock all, which pulls in all your executable into memory, the way your system works. So when you start off your browser, Firefox or Chrome, it doesn't pull all that into memory and run. It will actually just execute some part of that code. And if that, that file for that executable is not in memory, it will take a page fault. The kernel will pull that file into memory and then it will continue the execution. And that of course calls latency. So what do we have to detect latency from the hardware? Well, if you look inside your kernel configuration, you'll see something called config hwlat tracer. And it's actually available on Fedora th um, 31 system. I checked one of my systems, uh, which was Fedora 31, and it actually had the hwlat tracer enabled because when it's off, it doesn't cause any overhead at all. It's only cause effects, it's only adds overhead to do the tracing when you enable it. Uh, but I also noticed that my Debian systems don't have it enabled. And I don't know why, but because it's a useful feature to see where the latency of the hardware is. And when it's off, it doesn't cause any overhead. So what it does, is it runs in a really, really tight loop with interrupts disabled and checks to see if there's any gaps while it's taking timestamps. It'll run for a width of microseconds within a window. By default, that width is 500,000 microseconds or half a second. And the window is a million microseconds or one second. So basically it runs for, it goes into this tight loop for half a second for every second on your system. And you could determine the, or you could change the width and the window by looking into the, uh, the sys kernel tracing HW lat detector directory. And there's two files, a width and window to modify these uh, parameters. And once it's done, it'll actually bounce from one CPU to the next CPU to the next CPU. So it does each of these windows on a single CPU and then moves to the next CPU and does the same thing and moves to the next CPU. Uh, and you can determine which CPUs that runs on by the tracing CPU mask. Also, it will only trace if it detects something over a greater, some number of uh, thresholds. So there's a file called tracing thresh that you could set. By default, it's 10 microseconds and any gap that's greater than 10 microseconds, it will record. Otherwise, it could just be recording a lot. If you do one microsecond, uh, a cache miss or whatever, a branch prediction, if you're looking for those, you will probably see a lot more um, hits. But 10 microseconds is usually the, the way to go. So how do you get to this? Now, if you have this enabled in your kernel, uh, first thing you want to do is you want to mount the sys kernel tracing directly, uh, uh, directory. If you have the tracing directory enabled, uh, they're inside the sys kernel directory, there'll be the tracing directory will be there. Uh, you don't have to create it. It will always be there if your kernel um, has it configured. And then we do is you would mount, mount it with that option. Uh, for most of these commands to get rid of all the paths, I usually CD, change directory into that tracing directory. And then for the first thing you see, I, just for example, I cat what the hwlat detector width file was, and you'll see it's 500,000. So I'm gonna be bold and change that number from 500,000 to 900,000. Basically, nine tenths of a second out of every second, I want this thing to run. But remember, it only runs on one CPU at a time, so it's really not that bad. So from then, if you notice, I cat the tracing thresh and it's 10, so it's going to make that mark. So I ran it, I did this, I let it sleep for 100, and then I cat trace, trace is the file that shows you that information. The first thing you'll see is, uh, I want to stress is inside the tracing information, you have this, what we call the latency field, uh, which tells you when interrupts are enabled or disabled. In this case, you'll notice that they're all disabled. And by the way, you'll notice that the shift of the, uh, they don't actually map correctly from the arrows. The IRQ's off, if you follow it down, it's one off from the D. That D should be underneath the IRQ's off. But what happened was this code was originally written when uh, process IDs had no more than 64K and of, of elements or no 16 sorry 16k of elements and as you can see there's 211,000 processes so basically the process id can be no longer no bigger than maybe it was 64k i can't remember what it was but it was much smaller and now that we allow a much larger number of uh, process ids 
it caused the process ID to be bigger than what the code was originally written for, and it shifted everything over, and the title didn't match. So ignore that. Ignore the little offset in that shift there. But the important thing is that D is supposed to be IRQs off. When D is set, it means interrupts are disabled when that trace happened. If it's a dot, it means it was enabled. And since we're doing all this with interrupts disabled, it should all be Ds. The next is whether or not the process should schedule, and you'll see at N if it needs to, uh, whether or not it's running at a hard or soft interrupt, which it's not here, and the preemption depth, which I'll talk about at a later time. So the delays timestamp, this is the timestamp that's done uh, by the tracer. The tracer actually has a timestamp that every time you record, you can modify this timestamp inside that trace FS directory in the tracing, you know, sys kernel tracing directory. You'll see there's a tracing or trace clock file that you can modify which clock to use. This is the clock that it uses. The next one is a little bit of a misnomer. It says function, and that's because the tracing was originally written for the function tracer and there's a lot of other tracers that have been written since time, but we haven't updated the title. So it says function when that just means whatever the tracer is doing. Um, and here you'll see one, two, three for the hardware latency tracer. We'll put underneath the function field here, a one, a two, a three for each iteration. So you see how many was hit, especially if it overflowed, you'll know how many, uh, which uh, position it was in. The next is the inner loop. Now I'll explain this a little bit in more detail in a short second if you, in another slide, but the inner loop is the timestamp it takes. Now you'll notice that every number, it'll be either zero or you'll usually, the inner or outer loop will either be, it'll have to be greater than 10 because the threshold, it won't record anything unless it sees something greater than 10. But you'll see the 14 and 15. So the 14 means it happened, it discovered it in the inner loop. And then the 15 is that it discovered it in the outer loop. Now again, I'll discover, discuss this a little bit later. And the timestamp here, you'll notice this timestamp is a little bit different than the timestamp that the Tracer uses. This is an internal kernel timestamp that just basically lets you know when it happened. And this is actually when the first instance it finds happens, it'll record the timestamp. So it's a little bit more accurate, but it doesn't match the tracing timestamp, unfortunately. And finally is the count. This means that 42 means that it found 42 instances that were greater than 10 microseconds within that loop. Remember, this is the output done after the window. So a trace only happens after the window has completed. So it should be no more than one second apart because I ran for 900,000 microseconds uh, within the million microseconds. And then at the end, it does, gives me this report and showing showing in that inner outer, what was the max it found in the inner, what was the max it found in the outer. And now the count says it found, uh, between those two, it found, for, found 42 instances that were greater than 10 microseconds in latency. And this is the diagram showing you how this is done and why there's an inner and outer loop. So the first thing we do is reset the last time, the last T2 counter to zero. And then we take two times timestamps right after another. We, you know, we get time, get time, and put it into variable T1 and T2. Then we look to see, hey, is um, T2 have, if T2 doesn't have any, um, it's, if T2 is zero or the last T2 is zero, it goes down and does the compare. You'll see it does the compare of, okay, what's the difference between those two timestamps, T1 and T2, actually T2 minus T1. And that gives you the delta. And if it's greater than the last thing it found, it will save that recording. And if it's greater than 10 at the, or the, the tracing threshold at the very end of this whole loop, uh, then it records it to uh, the trace buffer. Uh, the outer loop records this whole calculation because you know, uh, when we first did this, we just did T1, T2, and we missed a lot of um, latencies. Uh, we had this one machine that had an SMI go off every 11 minutes, uh, 200 microseconds, but it never was found until we added this outer loop because it was go when it would go off, it would go off while we were calculating the differences. So during this whole window, we want to make sure we catch everything within that window. So we actually look at the calculations from the inner and outer. And since the outer loop actually has a little bit more uh, work to do. That's why we record them differently. We record the inner loop because nothing happened in between the two. It was just two timestamps right after the other, right after each other. The other one could be affected by branch prediction and uh, cache misses and such. So that has a little bit more uh, leeway. So we want to know. We want to differentiate between whether it was found in the inner loop or the outer loop. Okay. So that's enough with the hard latencies that you can find in the hardware. Well, what about the kernel? Well, the, one of the things that the kernel, we have interrupt latency and interrupt, there's several things about interrupt latencies. One is how much latency that an interrupt can interrupt your process. So your process wants to go and it gets preempted by an interrupt. That's a latency for your process. There's also a, when interrupts are disabled, 
that we want the interrupt to come in real quick. So we have a latency. So when a interrupt comes in, that usually means that a device wanted to do something. And if we have a keyboard or we type on the keys or we're doing networking traffic, we want that when that network packet comes in, we want to process it right away. But if the interrupt handler can't process that uh, networking packet, that's a delay and that's a latency itself. So it's they're both interrupt latencies, but they're, they're two different meanings. Uh, we have IO latency. So when you read and write from a device, this is something you'd like to measure, like how fast is writing to a device works. That's the latency that we do like to measure. And there's also the kernel has a bunch of maintenance tax, tasks that it must complete. And if your process is not aware about what the kernel is doing for basically keep making sure your system is running nicely and smoothly, uh, it could preempt your process from going on. And the kernel goes ahead and done some, does something that makes sure the system runs nicely, but it perhaps could have waited a little bit longer or ran on a different CPU. So you need to be aware with all these. But first, let's talk about interrupt latency. So what are interrupts? Well, simply put, and here's another little uh, uh, clip art that I drew a long time ago. Uh, your CPU is basically running, doing your processing over and over again. But if you have like start typing on the keyboard or move your mouse or networking packet comes in, there's gotta be a way to tell the CPU, stop what you're doing and take this external uh, process or this stimuli, this external stimuli, you must handle it now. So the CPU has no idea about it unless it gets interrupted. So an interrupt is basically just a way of telling, letting these devices stop the CPU from what it's doing and say, hey, you need to work on this. But there's some cases where the process, the CPU is doing something that it cannot be stopped. It must continue and cannot be preempted uh, by a external device. And in that case, we have what we call interrupts disabled. And just think of it this way that it just says, I'm gonna ignore everyone and just go on. So looking at the latency from an interrupt. So your program is running along, a, de a device triggers an interrupt, and then your interrupt handler happens and you, <clears throat> it comes back. So that gap here that you see, that's your latency. And the latency from the interrupt is what's going to be measurable in your program because it's not running, it's handling some process. But what about this delay that we see from the device when it triggered to the interrupt handling? Why, why isn't that lined perfectly up and down? Well, this is where I call the interrupt latency because interrupts could be disabled. The entire latency there, the, this is the really I call the full interrupt latency. And this is when you're worried about response times from the device. So when a device triggers, uh, so sometimes if a program is waiting on a device, uh, the device interrupt comes in, it calls the interrupt handler, the handler processes the device and then just comes back down and then passes that information off from the device to your program. And that time you may want to measure as well because that's the full interrupt latency. So before I go further, I want to talk about, like I said, I'm a maintainer of F-Trace, which is the uh, official tracer of the Linux kernel. And also what's called trace-cmd, or what I like to call trace command. Now, if you see on the slide, it says https colon slash slash trace-cmd.org. Remember that because it has the link below. Uh, trace command happens to be installed on several distributions, Debian, Fedora, they all seem to have it. Uh, but if you want to get the latest and greatest, because I'm under active development and I haven't made a full official uh, new version recently, uh, you want to get the source code the best to get the most of the features. So go there to get this. And now from the rest of this talk, I'm going to kind of be using trace command uh, to interact with the latency of the tracers. So measuring latency from the interrupts. So if you want to measure, like, say, that the interrupt handler latency, what that's causing on you, uh, you could run this kind of nifty command, which trace command record, which means I'm going to record it to a file, dash p is the tracer you want. Yes, dash P is a misnomer. Should, you know, say why not dash T, but dash T is already taken. Uh, when I first wrote F trace, we called them plugins, not tracers, but now plugins have a different meaning. So just remember dash P for your tracer. Uh, dash L is to limit the function graph tracer to uh, do IRQ and anything that has ends with interrupt because those are your interrupt handlers. And eventually I want to, I also want to enable the IRQ handler entry event. Now, this is the dash E is for an actual event, which is a static event within the kernel. Um, Linux kernel has over a thousand of these events all over the place. You could uh, find them with trace command list dash E that'll list all the events that are available that you can look at. A lot of them are interesting. The IRQ handler entry means every time a, um, a device interrupt happens, not a timer interrupt, 
that's where those underscore interrupts are usually kernel interrupts, where the do IRQ is a device interrupt. Uh, when a device interrupt comes in, you get to see what device that was via the event from the IRQ handler entry. So when I did a report, after I did a record, I let it run for a while, and I did a report, and uh, dash L will give me the latency. Remember I told you about the D dot dot one, you'll see that three D dot dot one. The first number there is which CPU it's on. And since I don't want to see a bunch of mixed interleaved CPUs, because if I just do trace command report, it shows every single CPU and it gets messy and didn't give me a good screenshot. So I just said dash dash CPU three, which will tell trace command report only show me CPU three in the data file. And this is what I get. You'll notice this little uh, section right here. This is where the interrupt latency happens to be, uh, where you could uh, see how long the interrupts took. Now, you'll notice that there are some pretty big interrupt latencies. Like that one, uh, the EM, well, first of all, you, you see the, uh, the trace event called IRQ handler entry. And that is the uh, trace event that was for my networking device. So EM1 was my networking device, and it was on interrupt 26. As you can see from there, I highlighted in blue to see which the, the name. Um, and so I know that do IRQ was from my networking device. And at the bottom there, you'll notice it took 98 microseconds to handle that device. That's pretty long. You know, that 98 microseconds is a pretty substantial delay. Uh, 24 is kind of long as well. And that was another networking device. Please note, this is not a real time kernel. This was actually just the latest, I think Linus's tree I downloaded and was compiling it, had bunch of things enabled. I have other things that kind of delay things. And I ran this test on this kernel. So what happens if I actually did this with a real real-time kernel? Well, this is, I took the 5.4.14 RT7 uh, kernel and <clears throat> tried the same thing on that. So what I got for that was uh, this output. Now, you'll notice that there was kind of a large gap there, that 19 microseconds is still kind of long. I'm not going to tell you why uh, why the real-time kernel is better at handle interrupt handlers than the normal kernel is. Uh, I've give given several talks on that before. Look them up. You'll find them, and I'll probably give more talks later. But that's out of scope for this. This just lets you know that for the real-time kernel, it behaves much better than the normal vanilla kernel. By the way, the rest of my um, talk, this talk, is I'm running on the kernel. So latency from interrupts. Remember I talked about this part where uh, this is delayed from when the device trigger happens to when the interrupt was able to go off. And I also said that this happens when we disable interrupts. So let's take a little look at how we can measure that. Another thing that's interesting that we want to look at, not just disabling interrupts, because a lot of times when the interrupts are disabled, uh, we're also worried about being able to schedule. And there's another way the kernel could do it. It could keep interrupts enabled, but also it could disable preemption, uh, where interrupts could come in and handlers could work, but the CPU, the kernel will not let the CPU schedule another process. So if a process has is running, a low level, a low priority process is running and it disables preemption and a high level, uh, high priority process comes in and the interrupt goes off and the kernel says, hey, this guy needs to run. Well, the kernel's gonna come back and say, no, this I have preemption disabled, you have to wait. And that's another form of latency from the kernel. Um, so preemption disabling happens when interrupts are disabled and because you can't notify the task to stop. So that's just an error. When you disable interrupts, you basically disable preemption uh, because the CPU doesn't know to change. Uh, spinning locks, when you take a spinning lock, you, the kernel has to disable preemption because a spinning lock means that it's uh, when you have a lock, if another uh, task comes in, tries to get the same lock, it's going to spin. It's not going to wait for it. It's, it's not going to go to sleep. It's not going to wait. It'll just spin hoping that lock gets released quickly. If you let the task schedule out while it's holding that spinning lock, it could cause a deadlock because maybe it gets scheduled back on on the guy that's spinning and waiting. So you can't let uh, any task holding spinning locks to preempt. And then also there's a, a, one of the uh, optimizations that could be done on a kernel is to, uh, when you're accessing per CPU data. Now, since it, if all the, if you don't care about other CPUs because when you access data that's on your CPU, a uh, process that on another CPU is not going to access it, but you worry about scheduling out and scheduling in, because if you schedule out and another process comes in, it will now access that same uh, per CPU data. So sometimes to do this, if you don't worry about if the, this data is not done by interrupts or, or not touched by interrupts, you're okay. But if you have the CPU um, data, you can just turn off preemption 
modify your CPU data, and enable preemption. And basically, that's your really fast lock. But that's another reason why we have preemption disabled. So now we have um, the latency tracers. But as you already saw, the HWLAT latency tracer. Now I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of other latency tracers we have, which is the IQ's off latency tracer, which detect, which basically traces all the times interrupts are disabled. The preempt off latency tracer is where it just looks at preemption being disabled. But what I like the most is the preempt IRQs off latency tracer. And this is the one I use. I don't really, the other two are more to me academic. Well, the IRQs off is useful if you're worried about just the devices coming in, but the preempt off is kind of, it doesn't measure interrupts off. So it's not as useful. It's more academic, but the IRQs off uh, the preempt IRQs off tracer is nice because it will look at the whole time from when interrupts are disabled and preemption are disabled together as a whole. So that's really the true scheduling latency that you would have if you have a high priority task that wants to do something. And no, none of these are configured in a production kernel because they actually do have overhead even when they're turned off. So you don't see them enabled, but they're usually in a debug kernel. Uh, they're nice to have. Um, there's also trace events. Remember I told you those little trace events that are static trace points within the kernel? There's a preempt and IRQ disable, enable disabling events that are out there too, but because they require wrappers around this, uh, they also cause a little bit of overhead when they're in there, so you won't see them enabled on a production kernel either. So if you go and you open up your make menu config and go to kernel hacking tracers menu, now make menu config is when I go into the Linux source code and I want to modify the configuration. Uh, there's an end curses way of modifying these configurations. You'll see, you will you can find these um, where these tracers are enabled and disabled. And like I said, if you go to kernel hacking menu and then the tracers menu, you'll see this menu. And in that red box, you'll notice that you have, it starts off with the preempt uh, enable and disable trace points. And you'll see they're off because this is a production, this is more for the production kernel. You have the interrupt latency tracer and a preempt off latency tracer. Well, you may ask, well, where's the preempt IRQs off latency tracer? Well, that's automatically enabled if you have the interrupt tracer and the preempt tracer. If you have both of the both of them enabled, the preempt IRQ off tracer will also be enabled. It, it goes uh, without saying. Uh, but you'll notice there, I have another tracer down there, which is a scheduling latency tracer, which is actually something that you should have enabled even on production systems. So tracing latency from interrupts with, um, the same preempt. So now what I'm going to do is start, we'll use trace command start. It's not trace command record. Trace command start just doesn't record to a file. It just enables tracing. And the latency tracers only shows the max, so you don't really need to do a recording. So you do this, you enable the dash P preempt IRQs off. And then I notice I, I enabled an option, sim offset. Well, why did I do that? Because if you notice down below with the blue statements down there, it has the offset of the function. So when it traces the function, because it enables function tracer where these happens. And I also like to know where these, uh, where in the function that happened, not just the function name. If you take away that option, you won't see those uh, extensions of the offsets of where the function, where in the function that the trace happens. And finally, I want to, Limits. This function, when you enable the latency tracers, it enables funct full function tracing. If you trace all functions, it causes quite a bit of overhead when you're tracing every single function in the kernel. So I like to limit it to, like, say, the interrupts and spin locks. And this is the output you see. And at the very end, you'll see there's a, a stack trace of everything. And there's some garbage in there. I'm not exactly sure why, but you can ignore it. But it kind of lets you know where it happened for that. So that's the next thing I want to talk about is the scheduling, scheduling latency tracer. Uh, this does not have overhead when you don't enable it. It's basically written completely on top of the trace events. So you have trace events enabled in your kernel, might as well have this enabled because it works. Um, so this could be, I'm kind of upset that I don't always see this on production kernels or production systems because it does, unless you're worried about maybe size because it does take up memory, it does have a memory footprint, but um, on speed wise, if you're worried about performance, enable this. It's a nice thing to have. And when you enable this, you have three types of tracers, the wake up tracer, the wake up RT and wake up uh, DL, which is the deadline uh, tracer. The difference between them is the wake up looks at any process, whether it's real time, deadline, whatever. But you know, some of these processes because it, it looks for the highest priority process, but because you know, they're not FIFO, like a real time task will run until it gets preempted. This guy may run until hey, it might just run out of time. And, and then it'll start the next thing. And then you'll see these huge gaps and the wake up does kind of hide 
the real time and deadline tasks because the wake up will trace the non real time tasks, which always have a larger trace, uh, a larger latency than the other two. And you'll never see the other two if that's what you're looking for, because it only records the max latency. Uh, that's why we have the wake up RT because the RT will ignore anything that's not a real time task and only trace real time tasks with the highest priority. And that gives you a much better uh, idea of the scheduling latencies for real time tasks. And the di um, deadline scheduler is the same thing for the same reason. So if I run with a wake up RT on the preempt car, this is what you get. Um, the only thing different now you'll notice is that I picked the wake up RT scheduler. I still have everything the same, except I also added uh, the sked switch and the sked waking trace events. Now, sked switch is the trace event that happens whenever one process gets scheduled out and another process gets scheduled in. And sked waking is when that process actually wakes up. So if your process is sleeping, waiting for an event, and that event comes in, something has to wake it up. And when it gets woken up, the trace, the sked waking will trace that action. And it's, it's very similar to the other IRQs off tracing. Well, what's the problem with latency tracers? The latency tracers you have is, first of all, they're rigid, not very flexible. There's not much you could do. You enable and disable them. It gives you the max. Um, it's always recording the highest priority task or all tasks, like you said. Uh, you can't just say, I'm just I'm just curious about this one task. I want to see the latency of this one single task is. It's really hard to tell these latency tracers to record that. Um, and it only records the max latency. What if I want to know about all latencies, whether it's max or not? The average, a histogram. Uh, and it's specific to IRQs, preempt disable, or wake-up latency. That's all you have. You can't do any other type of latencies, like uh, I.O. latencies or anything else. So I want to talk about histogram triggers and events, uh, synthetic events. Now, next. This is where you get to choose your own events. Uh, this is where those preempt to IRQ enabling and disabling events come in handy, is for the synthetic events here and histograms. You can add filters. You could say, I only want to trace a specific uh, process. I don't care about any other processes. I want to see the latencies of a single process. It gives you a nice histogram of everything. So how do we create it? First of all, you got to mount the TraceFS file system, which I talked about earlier, um, if it's not already mounted. And by the way, if you run trace command, it automatically mounts, mounts it for you. Uh, and then what you have to do is you enable the IRQ um, lat. Uh, this is I create a synthetic event. So right here, I echo the name of the event I want to create. Uh, this is going to have two parameters. One is going to be a pro uh, type process ID. Another one's going to be a U64 because it's going to be a timestamp. Timestamps are always U64. And then I name the first. The first one's going to be the process ID that I'm going to trace as well as the, the latency. And now from here, making the histogram. So I do trace command start and dash E, which means I'm going to enable the IRQ disable uh, trace event, I, I mentioned those before, uh, that you have to configure them in, they're not on production systems. Dash capital R means a trigger. So I'm adding a trigger to this. And then I add my histogram, my keys and stuff. So I'll talk a little bit more about this. Here we go. Um, first thing I do is I map uh, two events. I have the disable event and enable event that's going to happen right after it. I want to make sure that these two happen uh, back and forth. And how do I map these two together? Since I know they always are on the same CPU when they happen because the interrupt disabled can't be preempted. So the enabled has to be on the same CPU. I'm going to make my keys that match the two, the CPU. Then I'm going to record the timestamp and load it into this variable called TS, uh, TS0. And I only want to trace if the common PID is greater than zero. Common PID is the, uh, all events have common PID. That's why it's called common. Uh, the process ID and all events, but this, the idle event has a number greater than zero. The idle event is of CP has a process ID of zero. And the reason why I don't want to trace the idle event is because it will schedule out and with interrupts disabled and then get scheduled back in. And then that will screw up this tracing. So I want to ignore this, the idle event. I just care about processes. And I could actually put a filter on a specific event instead of I said, if common PID equals some process ID that I care about. Uh, then from here, I remember that synthetic event I created? Well, I'm going to fill it up. The next thing with the um, I'm going to take here is look at the this is uh, IRQ lat. Well, this actually is a mis uh, I should have named it IRQ lat. Let's just call it lat. The lat equals common timestamp that U6 minus the TS0. Well, that TS0 was the uh, saved timestamp from the uh, IRQ disable event. Now, on the IRQ enable event, I want to take the current timestamp 
subtract the timestamp from the IRQ disabled, and that will give me the delta or the latency. And I store that in the IRQ lat variable. And I and then if you notice, everything that starts with a dollar sign is a variable uh, that you can use within this uh, the tracing. And then on match is the way of telling the IRQ dis, uh, IRQ enable trace event to say I want to match the IRQ disable uh, trace event to be, to execute this. Note that I have preempt IRQ dot IRQ disable. To put the on match, you have to know the system name of the IRQ disable. All events are grouped by systems, and the IRQ enable and disable are both under the preempt IRQ system name. So you have to put the full system name to make this work. And eventually, I now the trace. This is where I say trace means kick off or basically execute that synthetic event that I created with the IRQ lat with the two parameters, the PID and the IRQ latency that to that uh, event. And finally, in this trace command start, I want to trace that event that I just created, the synthetic event. So I'm going to trace the IRQ latency, and I'm going to create another histogram to make a histogram of it. So not only will it be in the ring buffer, and you can see that when the trace happens, it will also create a histogram of it. Now, if I look at that histogram, you'll see this is what it looks like, which is kind of nice because uh, I could see that the interrupt or for the number of times the latency, uh, the max latency of interrupts being disabled during this run was 21 microseconds uh, because I put the U6 in there. By default, the common timestamp happens to be nanoseconds, but by putting dot U6, it's uh, microseconds. So the max latency was 21 microseconds. It happened once. And the majority of the times, it's nice. It's like two, three, four um, microseconds, which is pretty good uh, IRQ off. It's not that long. Now, let's do the same thing for wake latency. I'm just doing, like I said, you can be much more flexible uh, than the other things. But I'm, now let's do the exact same thing for the wake up latency. And you'll notice that right now I echo wake up lat instead of the previous one. And I put in int prior. So I still have the PID, P, uh, the process ID, and the latency, but I'm also interested in about what priority uh, the wake up latencies were in. Because I want to record everything and do this. So I do the same thing here um, that I did before. Basically, this is the exact type of uh, format. And I run the tracing, and you'll see that it uh, the priorities. Now, inside the kernel, priorities are actually inversed. The higher the priority number in the kernel, the lower the priority actually is. So when you see like a 99 priority or 98 priority, that's actually a priority of two. It's not a very high level priority task. Uh, the lower you'll see a zero priority. That's the highest priority task could possibly be is when inside the kernel prio zero. And there's a history behind it. I don't have time to go over it. So you'll see that it happened like the latency was seven. The max or it hit one time it was um, primps. Uh, IRQs were off for or the wake up latency. Sorry, this is the wake up latency. The wake up latency was for seven microseconds, and it happened a couple of times. And you'll see here it's pretty good like wake up. Remember, this is the real time kernel. But histogram triggers and synthetic fence, they're powerful. They can enable on production systems. They're great to have. I mean, obviously, you can't have it matters what events you have, but the actual histograms and synthetic events can be enabled on a production system. You may not have the preempt enable disabled. The, uh, events enabled, but any other things, read IO, the wake up latency works, all this is on your any system you have. And it's easy to use, right? Everything I just talked about in the last few minutes, you understood. You understood everything completely. You could go off and do it yourself. Ah, well, it's a rather strange format, and it takes a while to get used to. Um, and I know because the problem is, if it's hard to use, people won't use it. Um, I know because I found bugs um, while using it that should have been caught if anyone was using it. And if it's hard, people won't use it. So we need a, um, something a little bit better because that we could do this work where people it's easier to use and people could do this on time. So or <clears throat> we could do this in user space. So welcome to the Vaporware. Some people say, welcome to the cloud. This is welcome to the vaporware. Well, it's almost vaporware. So if we need a new language that people don't have to relearn, well, what about SQL? Well, think about it. Events are like tables. The fields within an event is a column. And every instance of the event is like a row. We could join tables. And basically, these synthetic events are joining events. So why can't we do that? So 
from here, instead of having this archaic output, this looks much more familiar. And this is something we're working on. It's almost there. So we have our select statement, which everyone's familiar with. Uh, I mean, I know SQL and I reluctantly do, but most people do. And we have um, variables you can put in when anything has as you can label something as PID and it will find it for you. For example, the start is defined as IRQ disable. And another thing about trace, since trace command has access to the event directory, it could find that event for you and find the system that the event is for you. So you don't have to worry about variables. You don't have to worry about what system the event is on. Uh, you don't wor have to worry about um, synthetic events. This does everything for you. Yeah, IRQ enable for the end. And there's your combination. That's one way measure. So, and then you could say as IRQ lat, this will be your synthetic event that you can then reference later. So by naming the table, the table is the event itself and you named it. So you don't have to worry about synthetic event. Everything's done behind, behind the scenes. You just have to know SQL. And this is where you map. So let's look at the two together. So here they are. Um, this is what I had for the uh, disable IRQs and below is the SQL, the same version of that. And for the latency tracer, this is what we had for the latency tracing. And again, this is what I had for the uh, wake up. So to map the two together, if you look above, uh, you'll see the variables, all the variables that are the, that was there, that's actually done here before. So let me start off from breaking this up. So beginning, you had to create your synthetic event. Like I said, that's the naming of the table. Then you had to put in what is going to be the parameters of that event, of that synthetic event. That happens to be the selection field. So since if you don't have to put the as PID, but if you leave it out, all you'll see is arg some arg one, arg two, and will be meaningless. So it's good to name it. So when you see the trace point and you or trace output, or if you want to do something in the histograms, you'll see that work. You know, the sked waking, the from sked waking is the first event that you start with. So the from is the first event. And the second event that you're going to map is the join event. And you notice I put as start as end. So I only have to name them there and then I can use start and end every place else. And then from here, I the timestamp, remember I had that variable recording the timestamp and mapping it? Well, when I put in the code here, end common timestamp usex minus start dot common timestamp usex, trace command will know how to that, oh, we need to put a variable, we need a variable to map the two and it will do it for you. So you don't need to worry about that. Uh, and from here, how are we going to map? Remember I said you have to have a way of the, to have the two processes map each together. So the sked waking maps the process ID to the next PID. Well, here you just do join on. The on statement will tell you how to do those that joining, just like it does in SQL. And then you have this um, filtering where it will be the where. So if I put where start that prio less than 100, that's the filtering. Everything's very simple. So it's coming soon. I have everything working pretty much, um, except for the where clause. That's that's still a little bit broken, but we, we're almost there. And if you want to look at it yourself, uh, just go to my GitHub page. I have SQL histogram. You can echo it into the file. If you notice from here, I removed the where clause, and it will give you the output from actual, it will give you the output that it would run. Uh, we're already having work to put this as part of um, trace commands, so it'll be there for you. Um, and <clears throat> uh, what's it called? You have to run this as root because it needs access to the TraceFS directory, which is only available at root, or you could copy it over. There's ways to work, but hey, feel free to play and it will be there soon. So with that, thank you very much. Again, my name's Steve Rosted. I work for VMware. Check us out at you know on Twitter at VMW Open Source, as well as our blogs at VMware.com and Open Source. And now hopefully we have a few minutes for probably one question. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. So quick change of scenery, if hopefully you can hear me. And uh, let's see, does the technician say they can hear me? Hopefully. Uh, and, okay, let's see any other questions that are coming in. Uh, okay, let's see. Now I answered some questions already on the, in the chat. And Let's make a final way to, which is a way to make the screens bigger. And 
Well, I'll, I'll just answer the questions that I've seen. I've already written some responses. Uh, first was, how does it relate to other kernel systems like EPPF or monitoring tools like NetData? I know EPPF actually uh, uses perf uh, for its tracing, but also hooks into a lot of the ftrace infrastructure. And if you use BPF trace print K to debug your BPF module, it will actually write into the ftrace and you can actually read what you uh, presented or in your module. Uh, another question is, um, does the HWLAT detector support, um, or the latency detector support the on ARM64 architecture? Yes, because it's completely agnostic. It just disables interrupts, does spins, and does all its work. It doesn't need anything specific to the uh, hardware. The one thing that might have a little bit of hardware is if you have NMIs go off, there is some hooks in there to let you know that NMI went on because the uh, IRQ's disabling doesn't disable uh, interrupts. So, I mean, sorry, doesn't disable non-maskable interrupts. So if you disa IRQ disable will stop all normal interrupts, but non-maskable interrupts by, you know, by their name and nature uh, can't be interrupted or cannot be stopped. So it will detect uh, NMIs. So it's good when they go off that you know it's NMI that's going off and not the hardware. Um, one question was about how um, F-trace differs from S-trace. Uh, I, like I use S-trace all the time because it shows you the system calls that you're utilities are you or your application is calling but that's it it just stops at the system call f trace is where you can actually trace what does the system call actually do and if you want to learn what like sysread does and you know if you're learning a new file systems you know if you're looking at butterfs and you want to say hey how does butterfs how does it implement a read you could run f trace and actually do a read from the system call and then have f trace read uh, watch f trace trace the, all the functions that are being called within butterfs and and then look at the source code and you can learn how it works, or at least what it's doing. Um, I guess there's one question it was, can we use uh, re-nice or RT prior to affect the highest priority task profiled? It, well, it, if, it's, if you change the highest priority, if it's still the highest priority, it still will be profiled for the normal uh, tracing. Uh, but if you change the highest priority task to not be the highest priority task, it won't be profiled. So it just picks whatever at the current running time is the highest priority task running, uh, the profile. Um, oh, here's one. How do you compare this with dtrace and BPF trace and perf? Well, they're all kind of a little bit different and overlap slightly. Um, Brendan Gregg has a really good talk and I guess he has books about this coming out and I recommend reading it. Each one, has its pluses and minuses and i like to have a lot of tools i know some people say there's too many tools uh but if you only had one tool you won't have anything that does exactly what you need to be done and i find that i'll use perf sometimes i use bpf sometimes i'll use ftrace sometimes depending on which i think is the best uh tool for the use case uh now, someone asked what the minimum version for synthetic fence and histograms. I actually, unfortunately, don't have that offhand. I usually kind of do remember, and I'm surprised I didn't put it in my slides. Sometimes I like to put that into slides where they are available, but they've been available for some time. Uh, and there's a lot more work coming out. So, Let's see, uh, do the tracers have impact of latency values? Do the tracers have impact of the late on the latency values? Are the display latency larger than the reality without the tracers enabled? Uh, in most cases, it will tell you matters. Okay, yes and no, uh, and you could change it. Obviously, the Heisenberg principle, where no matter what you try to measure, well, or the, the fact that you measure it will affect what you're trying to measure. That will always be the case, but you can limit it. What you you could limit it to a point. Um, when I do latency tracing, I sometimes disable function tracing and only enable the trace events because tracing every single function when when you're trying to figure out how long uh, interrupts are disabled, um, you'll find that the tracing of the functions will increase that time significantly. So I will sometimes pick a few. I will use the filtering of the trace, the functions to trace. So instead of tracing all functions, I think I even mentioned this in my talk, I will pick maybe, I just want to trace the spin locks that are being taken and maybe a few other uh, functions that are going to be triggered and then just run the, uh, the latency tracer because that keeps the overhead down quite a bit. And I prefer that to get some good values for the tracing. 
But yeah, the more tracing you have enabled, it will impact the tracing latency times. But once you, if you remove all the function tracing, and event tracing, like and just run like the IRQ, it won't tell you. It'll tell you where it happened, but it won't tell you what happened in between because it won't, the tracing will be off. That's usually a very accurate number of what the tracing uh, problems or the trace in latency is. Yeah, to evaluate the uh, F-trace output, one needs to have good knowledge of the kernel internals. Generally, yes. Um, this is why I think F-trace is really good for learning the kernel because you look at the output and then you might say to yourself, hmm, what does this mean? And then you go look at the kernel and you follow the F-trace output and you look at the kernel and you kind of learn what it's doing. So um anyway i think that's about the last question that i can answer now uh, i'll be on slack uh just find me i've been hanging out at the uh what's the, the uh the track embedded linux you'll find me there uh i'm also on track linux systems but um feel free and like i said come check out our booth i guess vmware has a booth and come check us there thank you very much